Thank you. Thank you first, Michel and Zora, for inviting me in this very beautiful conference. So, in the 17th century, and especially around 1630, narratives relating to catastrophe changed completely. I won't discuss here the history of the meaning and of the use of the word catastrophe, and I, I use it here to describe natural disaster and witness in my mouth uh, means eyewitness author. Indeed, from this date onwards, catastrophe has been thought of as events. They came to be thought of as such through the production of numerous written accounts that was the work of a number of people whose profession was partly to write, priests, medical doctors, and historians. Compared with the previous period, such accounts are more numerous, more detailed, and above all, more narrative. They had often been commissioned by the town council or the church of a city, institutions that wanted their action to be recorded and promoted. The construction, at the same time, of innumerable plague columns in Eastern Europe and of devotional and commemorative buildings, such as Santa Maria uh, de la Salute in Venice or St. Carl Church in Vienna, has the same aims. Catastrophe appear at the same time in fiction, too. So, there seems to emerge in Europe, in the first part of the 17th century, a consciousness of the necessity to keep a record of catastrophes. Such a trend is not obvious, and it's not without ambiguities. European governments wanted to keep a record of that action as much as they wished to hide a number of catastrophes which could tarnish the name of a king or be interpreted as bad omens, as it was the case in France under the reign of Louis XIV. Besides, catastrophes are not part of official history which began to be distinguished from natural history. These accounts, sometimes bestsellers in their time, produced on the occasion of various European catastrophes, the earthquake in Naples in 1631, the plague in Rome, Venice, and Milan in 1613, the plague and fire in London in 1665-67 had therefore to be considered within an unstable and often debated discursive field between official and personal history. It is to be noted that they explore a completely new way of relating catastrophes through the role given to the narrative witness and by making its point of view the prevailing one. The writers seem to be conscious, in a way, of what language, language can express and what is ethically at stake in the narrative of disasters, and this is new too. In the following paper, I defend several hypotheses, mainly three. The first one being that the shape of factual <laughs> narrative reveals the change of the stance of the witness and of his traditional distance with the event. The second is that the distance allows the expression of a new aesthetic aim connected with a cathartic project. The third one is that the use of fiction corresponds to the new necessity to combine distance, empathy, and the expression of subjectivity, questioning the ability of language facing the catastrophic event. I think it accounts for the emergence at the same period of factual narratives and also of novels and drama. The discursive and axiological models, whether they are inspired by the Bible, antiquity or medieval times with Boccaccio, that shape narratives of catastrophe give but little room to the witness or to the expression of his own subjectivity. Many medical doctors announced, like Thucydides, Thucydides uh, that they were attacked by the disease, but managed to cure themselves, mainly in order to promote their own trade. 
Pliny's example inspires a stance combining curiosity, a taste for observation, physical courage, and a disdain for popular superstition. superstition. Thus does the Jesu Jesuit Giulio Cesare Braccini from Lucca, who was present in Naples at the time of the 1631 eruption. He establishes his distance from the events through a constant comparison between his own observations and those made by Pliny, which he confronts through a great deal of quotations. Through his scholarly reference of social and cultural gap, is created between the priest from the north and the southern populace. Bracini's relation to the catastrophe is reminiscent of that a stoic philosopher watching a shipwreck from the shore. Hans Blumenberg has shown that such a type of representation of oneself dominated the figure of the witness until the middle of the 17th century. Though Bracini's narrative was commissioned, he takes great pains in the dedication to a secretary of the King of Naples to justify his undertaking. Why write and recall what ought to be whipped away from memory forever? The writer does not insist as much on the moral aspect of this narrative as on his desire to tell what happened. He uses the word curiosity. Um, no, it's just huh? this one. So when I was confronted to such a serious accident, I could not restrain the curiosity of talking about the things that everybody wished to know, and I did it on the occasion that was given to me of telling the story of the file, and I had been commissioned to do it. Uh, he calls it irresistible and underlines the reader's wish to know, a universal wish according to him. The vivid colors of the description of the disasters makes a lively impression of the mind. Indeed, his narrative stands apart through its aesthetic rendering of the event and the elaborate style of the descriptions. He says that more or less. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Don't worry. Therefore, such a stance combines an emotional distance and his wish to communicate knowledge to bring back his readers' minds to life through style. This was Bracini's second narrative on the eruption of the Vesuvio. A year earlier, in 1631, shortly after the event, which occurred on December 16, 1631, he immediately published a 40-page letter. The next narrative was 200 pages. The way he portrays himself in this letter, although it was not meant to remain private, is much more intimate. Bracini explained in it why he's not upset. The reason, he writes, is be found in a dream. On the night when the earth shook, he was profoundly asleep, and he had a dream that it was an infant lying in his cradle, rocked by his nanny. In the passage, Bracini mentions his age, he is 59, and though the eruption of the volcano was also a landmark in his own life. He said that it was a dream which made him immensely brave in his own eyes, and that he was sent to him by God to enable him to dedicate himself for the help of his fellow citizens through his pastoral duties and his writings. Besides, the first narrative in such a story told in the first person of a gentleman telling how he saw men being burnt alive. The horror is kept at bay in a way, by the fact it is an embedded narrative, and also because it borrows many elements from typical description of the inferno. But it's also present through an atrociously and seemingly synecdoche, in the shape of a shard leg, which the gentleman happens to have taken away with him, and which Bacini examines carefully. In the 1632 narrative, the dream, the witness age, the gentleman's story, and the dismembered corpse have disappeared. 
The author has significantly left out the most intimate or frightening details, probably because these elements undermine the optimistic nature, nature of his cathartic ambition, and the second narrative was more official too. There are several other examples of what one may call eyewitness accounts by proxy. One finds several times first-person narrators within narr narratives in the first person. They are indicative of the wish to represent a climax in horror within the defined limits of a frame and without attributing the origin to the author, who is also the main witness. For example, in his account of the Milan plague, a doctor, Alexandro Tadino, inserts in his narrative in Italian the letter in Latin of another doctor, Giovanni Battista Appiano, who tells us in the first person how he suffered the disease. Appiano gives us a detailed account of the incredible physical and moral torments he went through. So the writer himself keeps for representing himself as a private individual and for expressing empathy with his fellow citizens. Such a distance also enables the expression of literary ambitions, and they were clearly stated in several accounts published at the time and which seem to have been very popular. There was undeniably a call in the public for this type of literature. Two letters, one written by an historian, Agostino Mascardi, and the other by a poet, Claudio Achillini, reprinted several times in Rome in 1630 and in Bologna 1631, show this. The first letter tells us about the plague in Milan by using many scholarly allusions to classic mythology and through elaborate conceits. The second letter prizes the style of the first, but shows a more moral and religious point of view. In the foreword, the publisher underlines the capacity of style to find beauty in horror and thus to make it enjoyable. It discusses, it discusses a paradox contending that eyewitness accounts make eternal what ought to be forgotten. This paradox seems to have become a common one and was already underlined in Bracini. But it's only it's mainly a paralipsis. Uh, even though they express a duty or the desire to forget, the vast majority of narratives indicates a general will to remember and the convictions that art allow that. Another historian, Ripamonti, aims clearly in his description in the plague in Milan to emulate the literary frame, fame of Thucydides <laughs> or Boccaccio. He also claims that he wants to entertain and so tries to insert comic anecdotes in his narrative to give his public what he calls a tragic comedy of the plague, I quote. This is also done through distanciation. Indeed, in the last chapter, the reader can be entertained by the kind of literary and comparative history of the plague. Such a conception of catharsis is based on the notion of pleasure gained from the spectacle of horror and on comic relief. The author uses classic devices of comedy, such as equivocations and misunderstandings. Bracini insists more on the knowledge gained through the representation of horror, Ripamonti on the shock, on the shock um, on the senses and the pleasure derived from it. But both draw on the same conception inspired by Aristotle's poetics, a passage repeatedly discussed throughout the Renaissance in which Aristotle prizes the mimesis of ugliness. Such a theoretical background accounts also for the theatrical and rhetorical nature and the aesthetic pervading these narratives. A few writers disagree. However, most of them, at least most Italian writers, share the idea that a community in the aftermath of such a catastrophe needs art as a shaping medium for experience. This implies, as we have seen, that horror should be put at a distance. 
the expression of subjectivity of the eyewitness is partly discarded, and the private and personal aspect of his experience is not really or rarely considered, except for an indirect way. A way out of this conflict between eyewitness testimony and the expression of subjectivity was experienced in the past by Boccaccio. In his evocation of the plague, the eyewitness account of the author-narrator is only used to confront the authentic nature of a minor incident, the contamination of pigs which have touched infected clothes. No one in Florence gives his point of view on the events except a character in fiction whose name is evocative on nature's rebirth, Pampinea. It is she and she only, that expresses in the first person the loss of her parents, her loneliness in the house, and her fear. In that way, the author narrator lets someone else speak to express the worst part of the experience and also what is the most private. This also confirms the existence of a kind of theatrical model in the storytelling of catastrophe. It may be one of the reasons why a priest, Benedetto Cinquanta, who happened to be a playwright too, uh, chose to give his account of the plague of Milan in a play that had never happened before and would not happen again in the following century. This text stands on its own. The series of vignettes, the intertwined that twin stories in which there is no distinction between main plot and subplots make it singular. The forward uh, is widely different indeed from the justifications one can find in the non-fictional accounts mentioned before and which rely heavily on the powers of speech and representations. Cinquanta describes in detail the process of creation uh, and what its aims are. It does not assume there are links between poetic creation, knowledge, pleasure, and morals. He insists on the discrepancy between such an event and any attempt to put it, at putting it into words. And this is probably easier to grasp for us and for a contemporary reader than Braccini's or Ripamonti's optimistic conception of catharsis. Chaos, indeed, has no shape, and Cinquanta distorts language to describe shapelessness. It's also, in my view, represented in the image of a pit on the frontispiece, rarely represented, really. But it's the only occurrence I know. He uses repetitions that suggest it's impossible to tell apart, separate, or grasp, I quote, confusing confusion, monstrous monster. Um, this kind of repetition, for example. Uh, it's not translated, but you, you can understand. La confusa confusione di morti, mori, bondi, del male, di gridi, urni, spaventi, dolori, affanni, timori, crudeta, atroci, omici, disperazioni, lagrime, esclamazioni, di povertà, etc. It's very, very interesting. Uh, grandi, piccoli, ricchi, uh, everybody was ill. Grandi, piccoli, ricchi, poveri, maschi, femmini, nobili, nobili, gianna, nanna. Chi voleva il precipizio, chi la fuga, chi la vigila, chi il silenzio, etc., etc. Ok, um, so... Um, he gives list of words on the plague that no sentence can organize and no story, therefore no ordering of the experience of what has actually occurred is possible. The writer claimed that he decided through his poor writing to serve the memory of the dead he has only given to the world a minute part of what has taken place. And this is not a banal attitude of self-effacement. He expresses the same idea of the huge scope of the event in the play itself, representing a variety of actors and a multiplicity of point of view. The 19 characters say that has never been uttered before. This is not only the words of he who, infected by the disease, could have died, 
like Dr. Apiano in Daddy's Not Narrative, but also he or she who dies or loses his or her child, father, friend, or spouse. All possible situations of loss are represented. One character say that he feels guilty for having survived his close friends and relatives, a feeling I have never seen expressed in texts of the period. Another describes a stench of corpses so strong and disturbing that he almost faints. faints. And it's also the story of what no account at the time has ever recorded. The point of view of an undertaker making a list of the various ways of dying and of the way he has found the corpses inside houses. A woman escaped from the Lazarets describes the filth, the screams, and how sick women die giving birth to corpses. The moral consequences of the trauma are also considered. A girl said she has suffered too much to obey priests anymore. Its consequences on the souls and bodies of men or women are shown. Several characters, without being infected by the plague, become ill themselves through their fear and imagined representation of the disease. The 19 characters of the plague are as many witnesses giving an account of their experience of the plague. Among them is a priest, Fortunato, who seems to be the author, the writer, and who describes his surprise and gratefulness at having survived. The play is not only a monument to suffering and woe, as the author had announced in his preface. It beats healing fictions, people recovering, people converting, people having suffered loss who built a new home. To conclude, as here Anya Leiblich, Yuval Hariri, and Carol Cadron, uh, who have underscored um, in this conference, a testimony as a discourse of trauma is an historical construction. Far from being, in my view, essentially and fundamentally linked to literature, catastrophe is perceived as a partly aesthetic experience expressed through a partly politicized discourses on particular cultural circumstances in 17th century European and more precisely Italian narratives. It is obvious that the authors of these narratives do not present themselves as traumatized, traumatized persons addressing themselves to a traumatized audience, not only because the word trauma, as you know, doesn't not yet exist, but for a complex set of religious motivations and because of a literary and philosophical tradition. However, one can notice that a kind of dissociation or fragmentation or contradiction, which are the major features of discourses on trauma as one uh, analyzed it in these days, characterize some narrative and rhetorical devices, which appear quite often in factual or fictional accounts of catastrophes in this time. Paradox of remembering what ought to be forgotten embedded first-person narrative, invasion of non-Aristotelian theatrical new forms, lists and enumerations, paradox of power, powerless of language. Concerning the audience, one can observe a common desire for narratives, for the benefit of a community of survivors. The legitimacy of an aesthetic perception of the event seems quite obvious to both writers and readers, although the ability of language to grasp the fact is questioned, exceptionally but remarkably, by Cinquanta. The eyewitness author is more present in his known narrative than he, he used to be. Not surprisingly, in his factual account, he is reluctant to deal with the individual and with horror as a whole. He remains emotionally distant, but his distance tends to be shortened. 
It is my claim that this modified, mitigated distance is a condition for the emergence of a fictional account of catastrophes. Fiction succeeds in shaping chaos through an indirect representation of the self. And as Michal Friedman said yesterday beautifully, fiction permits a negotiation of a space for a certain self. I perfectly agree. Uh, and this mitigated distance allows at least one, once, and one century earlier than the first journal of a plague year, allows staging extreme emotions as well as the disturbing impact of the event on the minds and the body, that is to say, in, an, in our words today, what we call trauma. Thank you. for a very thoughtful presentation. Questions, comments for a few minutes? Take the microphone. It's on the table. Thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting presentation, which provides the background also for the and uh, we are supposed to ask you about this point that you mentioned about the girl who says that she suffered too much to obey the priest. Such events usually raise the question of the justification of God. If one remembers Voltaire's letter about the Lisbon earthquake, the end of theodicy, does this transpire in this, these narratives? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, it's um, a very strange story because this girl uh, of good family um, doesn't obey to not anybody. And uh, she could have been punished by the fiction. And she had she had a very hard discussion with the priests in the, in the play, and she asked for bread, she asked her to pray, she asked for bread, and she said, give me bread, and then perhaps I pray, and she go away. And uh, then it's a reconciliation story, not with the priest, but she's uh, totally alone, and uh, she finds a mother who lost her children, and she's reintegrated into the society, more or less. But it's very surprising that in this uh, play written by a priest, and a very good priest, uh, I find a very good priest, and, uh, I say he was uh, famous uh, also for his uh, uh, devotional uh, uh, actions and uh, this kind of things. He's very, um, he, he inserts uh, this story very disturbing of rebellion and uh, uh, there is a rec reconciliation at the end but it's a story of rebellion. It's very interesting. Mm. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for uh, such a wonderful presentation. Uh, <clears throat> just if you can elaborate a bit, if you have any accounts of how <clears throat> audience uh, took uh, a presentation of a disaster in a, in a way of uh, comedy, uh, comedy appearance, or comedy or trailer, in, in a way of a, a play. I don't understand exactly your, your question. The audience, the reception, we don't know because uh, we don't know if the play of Cinquanta was represented or not. Uh, probably it was represented in his convent, but uh, it's not, it was written and it was published, it was, uh, uh, people read it, but uh, it was not represented. What is more, and it's a pity that we have no account of it. It was a famous playwright uh, besides. Um, 
What for me was uh, surprising was to see these letters, very rhetorical, poetical letters, um, reprinted several times, and it seems to have been appreciated. But for the play, th this unique example, and for me, wonderful example, yeah, it's something incredible. Um, no evidence of a representation. Um, I have a question considering the notion of curiositas or curiosity. Mm, mm, mm. You cited this author who said, I felt the curiosity to tell the story. First, I wondered, um, this is another notion that we have today, so curiosity not to see but to tell. And um, mm, mm, mm. How, how, come, how does it come to that? To, to that? And the other question is, um, as far as I know, curiositas was in, in the medieval uh, context a very negative. Yes. Uh, it was a sin. And um, so is this really the turning yeah. point? I think so, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sybil. I think so, and this curiosity is really staged in uh, this account. It's a guy who wants to be a new Pliny. And so he goes in the library, he takes Pliny's letters, and he reads it in the library to people. Uh, he observes, he, he, measure, he measures, uh, he goes on the volcano, he takes uh, stones. Uh, he wants to be a scientist, it's very clear. And uh, this is, uh, there is a story of the leg, but this is a more complicated thing. And he exam examine, examines the leg carefully, but in the second uh, a uh, narrative, as I, I said, it doesn't speak about it. Okay, we'll take one more, and then we'll move oh, on. Come on, come on. <laughs> Thank you very much for having uh, brought this example to us to this forum, which is so different. Uh, my my question was uh, initiated by the present one, which is on curieux, curiosity. Curiositas. And uh, I think that our colleague wanted to talk about the quality of curiosity, which is a sin. But uh, in the 17th, 16th and 17th century, the curieux and curiosity are not only objects that we can expose, exhibit in a cabinet de curiosity, mm -hmm. but it is also, I have studied a case like that, it is also um, uh, an ontology of facts which are different from different fields, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. disciplines, which are curiosity in the sense of an exhibition of many different cases. And I wonder if uh, uh, what you have said is not a part of that genre, which is an enunciation of cases because if you read different genres, which is the memoir or another or letters, we have a different kind of of uh, of um, um, style of uh, uh, emotional, uh, even an em emotional intervention of the author when he is uh, describing the curiosity. So I wanted to know if, according to what you uh, not according on the the case you have described, you have other evidence? Of uh, the sentence is uh, really curious. Uses curiosity in an other side because I could not restrain the curiosity to death. So, <laughs> you know, in this, but it's true that curiosity is also this uh, uh, kind of thing, and Bracini is. Um, it's not a collection, it does exist, it does exist, absolutely, uh, a lot of uh, things like that. But it's not a collection of strange um, yeah. stories, occurrence, anecdotes. It's really a narrative, uh, actually a, a narrative. And perhaps uh, these curiosities are small narratives. 